Hi there, I'm Black Bright broadcasting out of the UK. Welcome to my channel and if it's the first time you're passing through, welcome and welcome to my um, previous subscribers or my existing subscribers. Um, yeah, basically I talk on things that affect anybody really. Um, I'm born in the UK, Jamaican parents, spent a stint of 11 years in the United States, one year in Africa. And yeah, I work full time and I do this vlogging um, when I come home from work and it kind of re-energizes me and it makes me feel as though I'm doing something for um, my people or my community then. And so yes, um, we was tricked. What a set of people, I mean. They made everybody think that that plane wasn't going out. And then at one o'clock in the morning, they decide to sneak it out. I tell them people dread. The only thing is, is that if there wasn't a protest, maybe the whole 50 would have gone. But as it happened, I think 17 were put on the plane. There's some kind of differentials between 17 and 25, but it was less than 50% that went on the plane. So we have to thank God for at least for small mercies, basically. So now that plane has gone off. And as they allege, foreign criminals, serious criminals. I mean, they can't even stress how terrible these people are that they've sent back. But don't you think it's amazing that these black people who they love to put on the TV when they commit a crime and who they love to broadcast as being menacing and criminals, they cannot put them up on our TV screens and say, these are the 25 people that were put on the plane and these are the crimes they committed. This one was a murderer. This one was a rapist. This one was a gunman. This one was some big murderer or something. Not murderer, burglar or robbery or robbery with intent or whatever. And how they love to show black people up when they've committed a crime and stick their faces on our TV screens. Where are the faces? Where are the 25 faces that they have that's showing us that they are these serious criminals? And that's what pees me off because we're supposed to just sit back and accept and we can't prove it and there's nothing we can do. And then you kind of think to yourself, well, you know, Oh, I get so mad with these people. And so now they've said, oh, we've put 25 on the plane, including a murderer and a rapist. One murderer, you know, and one rapist. Not that I'm diminishing the crime. I'm not. I'm just saying. They're saying that they sent off, why don't they say the 25 or the seven, the 25 or the 17 that got on the plane? Suppose it was 17 then, because there's some discrepancy with the numbers. Just suppose it was 17 then. Why can't they say that we had 15 murderers? We sent over 15 murderers on that plane and two rapists. Instead of... We sent 17 people over, including a murderer and a rapist. Doesn't that tell you that the rest of them aren't, aren't um, convicted of serious crimes? One of them, I heard, had a driving offence, for Christ's sake. Driving offence. Speeding. And, you know, what is sad about this? You know what is sad about this is that the people who got who managed not to get on that flight were people who were able or who had access to legal support, whichever way. They were given a few days, maybe five days, I don't know how long they've got, but they've given, been given some time to get legal assistance because 
The ones that they didn't put on the plane were those that didn't have access to the phone five days ahead of being deported. So those are the ones that got left behind. But we don't know what's going to happen to them. We don't know when they're going to sneak them out. We're not going to know now because people have made such a fuss. They've had to kind of look as though they're conceding. But, you know, before we all went to bed, as far as we were concerned, the plane weren't going out. It was, I mean, we knew it was postponed, but we were told that the 50, that it was pending um, whether or not they had access to the telephone because that's the only reason they were stopping the flight because it would have been it would have been unfair for them to send them off without having at least the opportunity to get access to legal support or notify their families so now i don't know if the 25 the, oh, i don't even know just forget about the numbers i don't know if those that who were deported had access to legal um, support or they didn't or whether they just had access to their telephones we will never know we won't know until they reach the other side and you'll find some people scattering over there looking for them and doing interviews then maybe we'll get some truth but then it's too late they're already over there they're not bringing them back and they can't come back not for 10 years so I wrote down some few notes because sometimes it kind of triggers my mind and lets me know, reminds me what is important. So Sayyid Javid said none of those being deported was a British citizen or a member of the Windrush generation. So I'm assuming that by not being a British citizen, they weren't born in the, in the UK, they weren't naturalised as a British citizen. And if they're not of the Windrush, I'm assuming that they came after 1973 on their on their own volition by themselves and they didn't come over as children because if they came over as children it would have meant that they were brought over or sent over to somebody to care for them. So we have to assume that if they weren't of the Windrush they came of their own volition after and they were over the age of 18 and they came as adults. That is my interpretation of not being Windrush. Not just the the date before 1971. Okay, the people on the flight included, okay, it's 29 serious, serious foreign criminals, including a murderer and a rapist. The Home Office added. So, that's what I mean. 29, one murderer, one rapist. So what were the other 27 people guilty of? People have lived in the UK since childhood. Should, should that give them a right to citizenship? I was saying we're not asking them to get citizenship. All we are saying is that if they were in the country as children, that means that they have been acclimatized to this way of life especially if they haven't been back it also um, it also infers that they don't have anybody in Jamaica that you're sending them back to when they said and you know what the EU have got a fund they've got and they're protected by the um, Human Rights Commission of course now we're coming out of Brexit we've lost those rights but apparently, let me tell you how much them get return fund um, to ensure that to ensure a sustainable and credible policy approach to the management of migration flows. It is essential to address the problem of irregular migration and effective return policy in conformity with the Charter of Fundamental Rights and based on the preference for voluntary turn is key to this objective. Supporting EU countries in improving the management of return. The European Return Fund, which all EU countries participate, except for Denmark, allocates euros 676 million. That was in the period 2018 to 2013. I don't know what it was subsequent to that. 
and specifically it seeks to improve return management as well as to encourage the development of cooperation between EU countries with the country of return. In this context, the fund provides support for actions assisting returnees return to their country of origin and their reintegration processes and activities enhancing the quality of information on voluntary return. Measures are co-financed co by the fund and include, for example, the setting up of a voluntary return and reintegration program, specific assistance for vulnerable returnees, that could be people who are ill, unaccompanied minors, the elderly, etc. And support for innovative tools and actions supporting the sharing of best practices between EU states. The fund also co-finances activities of forced return in cases where voluntary return is no longer possible. E.g. where persons who have received a return decision have refused to return voluntarily. Where's the Commonwealth equivalent? If the EU have got this fund, it wouldn't surprise me if the Commonwealth countries do have a fund like that. But the deportees are not being made aware of it. I do hope there's somebody who's acting on behalf of those who go back and make sure that they do access um, that, um, that service that is meant to be for returnees because I know one exists but I'm wondering if there is such a fund so that they know they're not begging I mean there is nothing worse than when you access a service and it makes you feel as though you're begging you it's much it's much more different you'd have a different approach if you knew you was entitled and that money was set aside for your return and your reintegration but if you think that, OK, somebody's doing you a favour, you're going to feel embarrassed. So the Jamaican government, if they've got an equivalent fund, they should let the people know that they are entitled to claim. They have every right. The country's not doing them any favours. I'm not saying such a fund exists, but I've got a funny feeling that it does. Anyway, let me get back to this. Um, uh, I was going to say, you know, them going back to Jamaica, not knowing um, anyone is equivalent to me when I went to America. Now, when I went to America, I chipped because of certain circumstances. So I chipped and I went to America and I knew one person. And because I knew one person, I felt vulnerable. Maybe I didn't need to feel vulnerable, but when you don't know any anyone and you can't and you feel as though you need to be dependent on an individual, that makes you feel vulnerable. But it just so happened that I discovered that I had family on my father's side, which gave me confidence and allowed me some autonomy. But my point is, is that people who are going to Jamaica who don't know anybody or who know one person like I did, they are going to feel just as vulnerable. They're going to feel as though they have to depend on that one person. And is that one person going to be resentful? Nobody wants to take on a burden. Who wants to take on a burden? You haven't seen these people who they're sending over for years. And then the people in Jamaica are expected to accommodate them if you happen to be a relative. And then they're going to be thinking, why me have to take care of him and him and a money for give me? So where, where me for get money from? How me for feed him? And then they look upon the people like they're a piece of shit. And then those people who they've sent over become depressed. Some of them commit suicide. Some of them die by other means through stress or whatever. And who can we say whose fault it is? Is it their fault for committing a crime in the first place? We could argue that it is their fault. They shouldn't have committed a crime. 
or we could argue that they committed a crime 10, 15, goodness knows how many years ago. Why are they waiting until now, when they've spent most of their lives in the UK, to deport them to a place where they don't know anyone? And no provision is made for them to be accepted. It's not like they're saying, have you got family over there? Who are you going to? No, they assume that because you're born in Jamaica, you're going to find some. But it's like people, it's like when I left um, America to come back to England. I hadn't been out, I hadn't been to England for 11 years. And okay, I have family here, but I still had to navigate my way around the systems. I can't be there asking this person every five minutes what you do, how you do this, what has changed. Everything had changed in 11 years, including my friends. So, you know, you it's and I was born here, but I've been out for so long that when I came back, it was like the country was so strange to me. But I'm an adult, I'm I'm pretty savvy. You know, but when you're going to a place like Jamaica, well, maybe they will. Maybe we're underestimating them. Maybe if they left Jamaica when they're eight, they still have a strong essence of the culture within them. But I just think it's sad when you've spent 30 years or 35 years in the UK. You've established your family, your children, and then they're telling you, to maintain relationships through Skype. That's what they're telling them to do, you know. Maintain your family relationships through Skype. Suppose we never have Skype, what then? Suppose there's no broadband. I'd like to see them maintain their relationships through Skype. If their wives and family got shipped out. The thing is, is that these people they don't get an opportunity to see what it's like when the shoe is on the other foot. They never experience what we experience. And they never will. They never will. So, what else did I want to say? Did I want to say anything else? On Wednesday afternoon, that must have been last Wednesday afternoon. Oh, hold on a minute. Those given a reprieve and not immediately being deported, you notice that not immediately being deported, are believed to include a man who has applied to remain in the UK under the Windrush scheme. And I bet that's not the only one. He's, he's applying under the Windrush scheme. I bet you they've got people there who are applying for into, you know, indefinite leave to remain an extension of their, their visas. It wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. I wonder if they're all male. You haven't even heard of the gender breakdown. I mean, the way they're talking about one murderer and one rapist, the implication is that they're all men. So... I wonder if there's any females amongst that lot. There's something bloody fishy going on there. Because we should have more information. Why are they hiding it if everything is above board? Anyway, on Wednesday afternoon, that's last Wednesday, the Home Office said the chartered flight had flown to Jamaica and the people on board had committed crimes with a total combined prison sentence of more than 150 years. So everybody goes, oh my goodness, no wonder, I'm so glad they got rid of them. I'm so glad they're out of the country. Oh, that was a close shave. Where's the evidence? Any time a black person does the slightest misdemeanor, it's on the front pages of the newspapers, it's on the TV screens. Where are these people who have done the 150 years prison sentence or more? Why can't you claim them and, and show them off and say, look, look who we're sending off to Jamaica. These are, the, these are the serious foreign criminals. They did this, they did that. Put there, let us see. And so we can say, 
Oh, well, yeah. It, yeah, it is, it is right. It, they should go back. Give us that kind of peace of mind that you're treating people fairly and above board. That's all we want. We're not telling you to stop the deportation flights. We're not telling you that they shouldn't continue. What we're saying is, is that if you've got people on the flight who shouldn't be on the flight and it's illegal deportation and they haven't done serious crimes, that is what we're saying. Take those people off the plane and, and allow them to go back into the society instead of making it look like all of these people are massive serious criminals and we know that they're not because you that you know these people the media delights in celebrating black criminality the individuals on the flight who numbered more than 30 included 14 people convicted of drug offences, six people convicted of violent crime, and one person convicted of dangerous driving. Now, violent crime, you know, violent crime is domestic abuse. Don't underestimate domestic abuse. That is a violent crime. You lick down somebody, or if the police, if you um, try and resist arrest, they can consider that a violent crime. Violent crime doesn't necessarily have to mean that somebody's got stabbed or somebody has done something that serious. It just means that you've exercised some form of violence in some way. The Windrush Generation is the name for an estimated 500,000 people from the Caribbean countries who arrived in the UK between 1948 and 1971. But then I was wondering, wouldn't their offspring be Windrushians? But not necessarily if they weren't in this country. If they came from outside, they would not be Windrushians. So I think that's what they're saying. Um, they were granted indefinite leave to remain, but changes to the immigration law in 2012 meant many who arrived as children without their own documents found themselves unable to prove their status. And so what was happening is the mothers bought their children on their passports. And then, of course, like I said in the previous videos, it's not like we travel up and down. There was no need to get a passport. So these people have been just in the country indefinitely, 30, 40 years with no documents and no need to get one. But like I said, if they've been working, they should have some form of documents. They have to have had some form of documents because it wasn't always that we needed to prove who we were when we were in the country. The only thing is, is that with some people, they're a bit slapdash and they may not have kept documents that were so old. Me, I've still got my original birth certificate. Original, you know? Oh, what? <laughs> anyway. A former soldier and five, father of five, Twain Morgan, is also believed to have had a reprieve. A reprieve? I don't know if that means he's got off scot-free or whether um, he's, being, he's under consideration. And you know what? I was thinking to myself, I shouldn't have did all that brap, 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 and booyaka, booyaka, because it must have bonded them <laughs> when I'm saying the plane ain't going nowhere. <laughs> But you know what? I, I reckon that that is one of the reasons why they said, look, we can't, you know, we'll have egg on our face. We look like bloody idiots if we don't send out a plane. Plus, we put money aside for it. So we have to send off somebody, regardless of how many is on the flight. We have to send them off just so we can have a little bit of dignity. Wouldn't surprise me if that's what those customs or border force, whoever they are said about the plane and and told the judges as well because the judges want to save face as well don't they they can't be led to believe that just because you protest that's going to be a result that would be terrible because can you imagine if the, if they let us get away with protesting and stopping that plane they're going to believe that we have power and they can't let us believe we have power you know they can't do that that would be catastrophe can you imagine? Black people have power. Black people protest. And because they protest, the plane never went off. Oh, no, they can't have that. No, 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 no. So they go behind our backs, go and speak to the courts and say, what channel? 
you know, can you imagine how it's going to look, you know, if you don't let that plane go up? At least let us take 10 or 15, it don't matter, but that plane has got to leave. Otherwise, it's going to be embarrassing. So the judge probably say, okay, you know, 10, 15, blah, blah, blah. They do their little negotiation kind of stuff. Anyway, Morgan, 36, was granted an injunction on Tuesday evening, meaning his case will be looked to get at again. He arrived in the UK in 2003 and joined the army the following year. He was discharged in 2007 with post-traumatic stress disorder after two tours of Afghanistan, but had not served long enough to become eligible for British citizenship. So he served in the army, but he didn't serve long enough to get the citizenship. His sister Tanisha said when he came out of the army, he didn't get any support or treatment. He was left to himself to integrate himself back into society, and that didn't help. It made him who he is today, a shell of himself, zombified. In 2011, Mr Morgan, who lived in Birmingham, was jailed for six years after assaulting a man, and he served three years. So that must have been a serious assault, even though he just, even though he just served three, that had to have been a serious assault. Now, what she's saying is that it was as a result of the post-traumatic stress. She says, Tanisha added, I don't condone violence, whether it's my brother or not. But at the end of the day, had he got treatment, I don't think this crime would have been committed. And that is true because people who go through post-traumatic stress are people who are under stress. That's why they kill themselves and they kill other people. That's why you see those people, they go out and kill um, goodness knows how many. What country was it is in uh, two days ago when somebody goes in and shot up 26 people because he had a grievance? People have a grievance, they turn loopy. So you have to try and show love most of the time. It's very, very difficult sometimes, especially when people rub you up the wrong way. But, you know, people, there's a lot of pe fragile people out there. And when people are fragile, you don't know what they're capable of. You don't know if they're going to kill themselves. You don't know what they're going to do. Owen Hazley entered the UK on his mother's passport as, as, four, as a four-year-old. And at the age of 11 was granted an indefinite leave to remain. However... Those imprisoned for a criminal offence lose that right and have to reapply. And when Mr Hazley did so after completing a jail term for assault in 2016, his application was rejected. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't know that if you went into prison, you lost your indefinite leave to remain. And then it just so happens that he completed the jail term for assault in 2016, which is when the hostile environment ca um, bill came out or paper. So he wouldn't have stood a chance of getting that accepted. So that is a shame, that is. He told BBC Radio 5 Live, I hold up my hands to what I've done, but I've served my time. I've done my prison sentence. I've done all my rehabilitation. I've done my community service. As far as the government is concerned, you shouldn't have committed a crime, love. Once a criminal, always a criminal as far as they're concerned. There is no rehabilitation. And you know what? And there is no, you know, when they say, oh, it's phased out. What do they call it when you, it's spent? You know, like after 25 or 30 years, it's spent. Oh, no, it ain't spent, love. It's still there. Still on your record. Mr. Hazley has lived in Manchester for 29 years and said he didn't apply for a British passport as he previously had no need to do so. Make sure you people in this country right now whether you need a passport or not. As long as you're legit, get a passport, even if you're not going anywhere. His children are aged five, seven and nine, and he says he will now only be able to see them in summer holidays and over Skype. Home Secretary Sage Javid said last year that at least 63 members of the Windrush generation, 32 of whom had been labelled foreign offenders, may have been wrongly deported to deport to Jamaica. 
not may have, they were wrongly deported. And I think 11 of them died. In the Commons on Tuesday, this has to be last Tuesday, L Labour MP David Lammy asked Mr Javid how he could be confident that none of the men due to be deported, like this morning, were also victims of Home Office mistakes. The Jamaican High Commissioner, Seth George Ramakan, said although it was the same community we are, we are dealing with, the Jamaican community, it was important to be clear that there was a distinction between members of the Windrush generation and other migrants. Britain is a sovereign country. We have to abide by the law of the land. He added, however, Mr. Ramakan had called for sensitivity and compassion in the case of Mr. Morgan. The Home Office said it uses scheduled commercial flights for deportations, but charter flights where this is not an option, especially involving foreign offenders. So I hope I gave you a reasonable update. I hope there wasn't too much repetition and that, you know, what can we do? Mothers, try, beg you do. Look after your sons. Help them to avoid crime. Because I'm telling you something, even the ones British on this soil, if the parents aren't born on the soil, you never know, they might decide to sh ship off the parents and the kids. We don't know what they've got planned. Like America wants to keep America white, England wants to do the same thing. So, we there's no room for criminals, black criminals, even though they make the system such that it breeds criminals or criminal minds, depriving them of jobs, breaking up homes and all that kind of stuff. But we can't use that as an excuse because we know we have black people in the country who are successful, who are diligent, who are hardworking, who are successful, did I say successful? Who are committed, who are convicted, and I mean convicted, you know, have a sense of conviction, not convicted criminals. Yeah, so we have to do the best for the children because we don't want them ending up in jail and their future finished. But that is what the scheme is. The scheme is to get all the black boys in jail so they can't impregnate the women and so they can't breed any more children. There, I've said it. Out loud. Shoot me. That's all for now. Don't say nothing about my hair. I love the flame red, actually. Yeah, I kind of like it. I'm not sure the style, but yeah. I think it suits me. Anyway, that's all for now. Bye-bye.